Yeah, yeah you think it, the, all these all this deception is just going to collapse under its own weight? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the only thing that can keep it going for much longer than what it than than its than its uh, assigned lifespan would be literally like a false flag kind of um, uh, some some kind of cosmic gulf of Tonkin. Somewhere in the United States, there are those who believe that the government is hiding the remains of an alien spacecraft that mysteriously crashed to Earth. With more and more scientific evidence of alien encounters and UFO sightings, the idea of creatures from another planet might not be as far-fetched as we once thought. In fact, one of you out there could have the next alien encounter. Welcome, everyone, to the Synaxis podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm Josh. And today we are welcoming some very special guests, the Collins Bros. Paul and Philip Collins are award-winning journalists and the authors of The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship and Invoking the Beyond, The Kantian Rift, Mythologized Menaces, and The Quest for the New Man, as well as countless articles on their website, conspiracyarchive.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. We're so excited to have you on, and we're glad you reached out to our lowly podcast. Uh, we're honored to be yeah. here, yeah, from our lowly living room <laughs> in, in Lusk, Wyoming. Do you want to maybe make a brief introduction of yourselves for our audience? Sure. Um, well, I'm Philip Collins. Um, um, yeah, uh, usually, uh, when I, when I uh, in my bylines, I go by Philip D. Collins. Um, that that that's 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 not that's not you know an a, an ego driven choice you know kind of like you know how Engve Malmstein wants <laughs> Engve J Malmstein to <laughs> differentiate him from all the other Malmsteins out there. Yeah. I like the way he puts Ingwe J Malmstein on his album, so you know you don't confuse him with all the other Ingwe Malmsteins in the business. Um, um, the reason I, I I include my middle initial, which is is is, is you know shorthand for for Daryl which uh, is a horrible middle name. I'll, I'll never forgive my mother for that. <laughs> but um, um, the reason I do is to differentiate myself from Phil Collins, the pop star, um, um, which, uh, you know, I've, I've heard more than my fair share of jokes about. Um, but um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in terms of my, uh, my background, um, I have a, a communicate a, 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 a Communi- a uh, bachelor's degree in communication studies uh, and a bachelor's degree in liberal studies with an emphasis on uh, literature and uh, a uh, minor in philosophy, um, which I received in 2006 at uh, Wright State University. Um, uh, my, communi- my communication studies degree largely concerned itself with uh, print journalism, uh, media criticism, semiotics, uh, stuff like that. Um, and I uh, worked in uh, professionally in journalism for a total of, oh, let's see, I think uh, uh, I, I worked four years as a staff writer for the Vandalia Drummer out of Ohio. Um, and during my tenure with that newspaper, which was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful job, wonderful community to cover. Um, I, I acquired accolades, uh, which included uh, an Osmond C. Hooper Award for Best Photography, an Osmond C. Hooper Award for In-Depth Journalism for my coverage of the Maria Lauterbach case, which was a, a, a case involving uh, the sexual assault of a Marine uh, by the name of Maria Lauterbach at uh, uh, Camp Lejeune. And uh, that that led to actual uh DOD reforms that were spearheaded by Congressman Mike Turner. Um, and uh, that that case actually drew uh, uh, national attention. And um, it was it was the highlight of my career, um, um, uh, you know, just to receive a, an Osmond C. Hooper for my reporting over that. Um, I also 
uh, was uh, inducted into the media honor roll by the Ohio School Board Association for my coverage of uh, the Vandalia Butler School District. And uh, the city uh, named an entire day after me, November 7th, uh, there is known as Philip Collins Day, which was quite the honor to receive. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, I, I left uh, journalism to go into, uh, of all things, corrections, uh, the, the, you know, the, working in a prison, um, in which uh, I, I work at the uh, Wyoming Women's Center here in uh, 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 Lusk, Wyoming. But even then, even with my uh, career there, I, I kept one toe dipped in the journalism field with uh, uh, my stringing work at the Lusk Herald. And I was also for, oh, uh, four or five years, uh, a, a public information, uh, field public information officer and FPIO for uh, the WDOC. Um, and of course, in that, you know, in that whole time, um, we've also, uh, I've also worked with my brother on um, our uh, own personal research. Uh, we authored the book, uh, The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship in 2003. Um, and we, we, uh, put out a uh, expanded revised edition of it in 2006. Um, of course, that book charts the course and the development of uh, technocracy, or, it, you know, as uh, Aldous Huxley put it, a scientific dictatorship. And uh, then, of course, uh, what, two years ago, we released, um, mm -hmm. after seven years worth of work, uh, the uh, a, a book uh, Invoking the Beyond. And uh, We've also, you know, we we up until oh, uh, what was it around uh, up until 2000, 2011 or maybe no no but maybe a little bit two thousand seven had a relatively steady output at Conspiracy Archive in terms of articles, but uh yeah so that's that's pretty much you know that's pretty much uh my career. Uh, you know, as a, a thumbnail of it, relatively unremarkable, but um, gives people an idea of, of uh, yeah, of what uh, what I do. Yeah, and I'm Paul. I'm Paul Collins, and uh, yeah, um, I first started studying deep politics back when I was 17 years old, and um, uh, really got serious about writing about the topic when I um, was uh, pursuing my associate's degree. Um, I had a teacher. Um, he was a, he was a judge back in Ohio. He, he, he ran a court. His, his name was, uh, Joseph Palmer, but Joe, when he was pro you know, prior to his time as a judge and working in the legal profession, profession, he, um, he had been in Vietnam uh, and he was a Marine in Vietnam and he was recruited out of the Marine Corps by the CIA to basically, um, do intel gathering there uh, among the North Vietnamese. You know, he basically, his cover was that he was running a trading post as a Canadian and he'd collect intelligence from the people that, from, you know, the the different uh, NVA or Viet Cong that would show up, you know, and, you know, uh, basically they'd tell him, yeah, my cousin's on such and such a hill and he'd report back to the CIA and lo and behold, that hill would get bombed. There's that sort of, you know, and uh, he he ended up um, going to Hanoi because he befriended a uh, he befriended a uh, a, a, v, a, a NVA general and he ended up going to Hanoi for about two or three days. Uh, the CIA, he, his friend extended the invite to him. He reported back to CIA and said, I didn't I don't want to go. And they said, well, you're going. And so he went. And he didn't, he really couldn't function because he was the only white guy in the middle of uh, Hanoi and uh, there for about three days. And what he collected, they considered to be subpar and they were mad at him or somebody was mad at him at the agency and ended up blowing his cover, which almost resulted in his death. And uh, he came back to the United States. He ended up playing some kind of low level role in the whole plumbers affair when he got back here. And, you know, um, periodic and he didn't really elaborate on that, but periodically he would, you know, tell his story and give an oral history at school. 
And, um, you know, that's what really got me fascinated with the whole topic of deep, uh, uh, deep pop. Uh, well, I was already fascinated with deep politics, but that's what really got me going with writing about it, you know, saying this is a topic that I would like to actually write about and delve into and, you know, hit from a different perspective. And uh, so that's that's what I started to do. And, uh, you know, like you said, we were, um, you know, we wrote. Uh, the ascendancy of the scientific dictatorship. We had a first edition and a second edition. And um, and we also did work for Conspiracy Archive. And we did work with the former, um, well, he's deceased now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael syndic Corbin. Syndicated talk show host uh, down south of here in Colorado, Michael Corbin. Uh, a closer look. look we yeah, did great a great friend. He was a great yeah. friend. Terrific, um, terrific radio host. Yeah, but Mike was was uh, one of the people that actually got me started looking into actually a sacramental apo uh, apostolic form of Christianity. Before that, I would really just describe myself as some non-denominational Christian that, you know, church hopped and everything, you know, and Mike was a, was a very uh, devout uh, Catholic. He was, he, he, he was a friend, a close associate of, um, Malachi Martin and Malachi Martin was his spiritual mentor. And um, so, you know, he, he, he was one of the ones that really got me started looking into that because if one thing that I've noticed is that um, the deep state, these covert political circles, they really don't seem to be threatened by, um, you know, uh, just the, anybody going by that generic term, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. It seems to be, it seems to be the apostolic sacramental communions that really uh, get them concerned the most and that they are intently, they are intensely um, focused in on infiltrating, uh, whether it be the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church and all they, uh, um, the Anglicans to an extent. They're really, in, they intensify their efforts as far as those those uh, communions go, you know, um, whereas, you know, the more kind of uh, silly out there kind of mega church nonsense, they really don't concern themselves with because it doesn't pose a threat of any sort. And all. so, you know, that's what got me looking into, you know, starting to take um, faith a little bit more seriously than, you know, than I had prior previously. And all, but we did a lot of work for Michael Corbin's A Closer Look. We were on his radio show. We did his publication, A Closer Look, uh, the ACL report, uh, and all. And, um, you know, got into a few other publications along the way, slowed down a little bit there for a while, you know, started to have families and get into the job and whatnot, you know. And hopefully, there's seeing a pickup now as of this year. I, um, you know, we added a few more articles, three new articles uh, up at uh, Conspiracy Archive back in January, all of which address the issue of uh, of UFOs because it's becoming a it's it's becoming a serious topic now. Uh, you know, last last year we had the 2022 congressional uh, hearings and then the this year we've had, you know, hearings again. And so it's becoming obvious that, you know, they're really prepping that narrative for something. So we found it important to kind of hit on that topic, you know, from a from a perspective that is usually not not broached by most ufologists. You know, mo most of them, it gives most ufologists an ever-loving case of heartburn to suggest that there's a terrestrial deception afoot. And I think it gives them even, a, 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 even more um, of heartburn to suggest, well, you know, where there is some kind of legitimate otherworldly uh, um, activity going on, it's not of a it's not of an interplanetary nature. It's probably more of a preternatural nature and all. So it rubs it rubs people the wrong way, but it's really um, an approach that has to be taken and has to be considered uh, with this with this topic because a lot of stuff is now playing out. A lot of the trends are now playing out um, in a way that supports those those two. Uh, uh, you know, um, contentions concerning uh, UFOs, that it's, 
that it's of a the, you know that there's terrestrial deception going on for one and then for another there seems to be a preternatural element as well so you know that's what what we seem to what we're doing as of late and like i told you before we went on the air you know we're we're going to be prepping one about uh david grush and Luis elizondo here and in, in hopefully hopefully have it out before the end of the month and all because um we're moving from this kind of um this um government cover-up ploy to this new um a new installment into deception which would be the rollout of quote unquote disclosure. And so we want to be ahead of that game informing people of what's going on as as far as that as far as that's concerned. Because I people are going to start noticing things heating up here in that realm here very shortly, in my opinion. Yeah, I've been noticing it already for sure. Um I mean thanks thanks so much for that background. That was really insightful. And I, I wanted to ask you about orthodoxy because it seems like the arguments in your book kind of use that as the touchstone of all of these strange philosophies that arise like you track this this philosophical development through history and you're always kind of contrasting that with with the orthodox teaching on on these things and um i definitely want to get into all that ufo stuff but i thought maybe we could get into like setting up your your argument about like the kantian rift and um this category of the beyond and, and all of that and then work our way back towards UFOs. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, so our, our book, uh, in, in our book, we we uh, touch on uh, what I guess you could call a narrative construct known as the beyond. And the beyond, that neologism is uh, applied to any deific force that's invoked by the para-elite uh, to overwhelm national governments epistemologically and ontologically. The invocation of the beyond precipitates the uh, subsequent introduction of a deus ex machina in the form of a technocratic world state. And of course, that sort of uh, global managerial model is advantageous for the para-elite who lay claim to this vaguely defined uh, socio-political gnosis that qualifies them to lead humanity towards its glorious transfiguration. So typically the beyond when it's invoked, it assumes a form that is derivative of the deific powers we see populating classical mythology. Now, uh, it was Immanuel Kant's uh, epistemological revolution that uh, basically rendered the world out there uh, the external world as uh, perpetually imperceptible. It's been rendered a terra incognita. And with the metaphysical certainties of the classical era abolished, you have the rise of this new class of myth makers um, that are free to populate that terra incognita with their own surrogates for the divine. Uh, so these, these surrogates for the divine, they're, they're derivative of uh, classical myths, but they're also distorted presentations of classical myths. Uh, myths, they can be divided into two distinct categories. Uh, there's myths in the transcendent or classical sense, and then there's myths in the pejorative sense. Uh, myths in the classical or transcendent sense allude to truths beyond themselves. Uh, they're, they, you know, they're, it, it, they, they, they touch upon, uh, they touch upon uh, certain metaphysical insights concerning the cosmos, certain uh, universally accepted truths. Um, for instance, uh, 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 you have myths such as uh, the 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 myths uh, presented uh, with uh, the Hesiod. The Hesiod, for instance, uh, you know, with uh, Hesiod in the Enuma, um, he presents. Uh, uh, a, a, a golden age uh, of humanity and that golden age suddenly encounters this diminution um, and this decline and and you see a, a, a fall of humanity well this uh, this presentation of this fall uh, parallels uh, rather closely the fall that is uh, documented in the uh, Genesis account in sacred scripture so um, so you see where uh, Hesiod, with uh, his myths, he's pointing to uh, 
a a truth beyond uh, the myth. It's uh, you know, it's 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 a myth, but it's a myth in the transcendent sense. Uh, same with uh, 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 the myth of Prometheus. Basically, with the myth of Prometheus, um, you have a paganized account of the fall of uh, Lucifer. Um, essentially, Prometheus is the uh, paganized version of Lucifer. So there's kind of this universal acknowledgement of an adversary that it has uh, oppo- that opposes both God and man and uh, inspires this pneuma pathological impulse to uh, seek apotheosis, to, to uh, basically apotheosize the ego and uh, 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 assert oneself against uh the uh against the divine and to try to supplant the divine but um that those are myths in the classical or transcendent sense now most modern myths uh they they are actually myths in the pejorative sense they because they provide no uh no such insights into reality they don't segue into the fullness of truth instead they present an inverted hermeneutic that's not unlike the one that one finds in uh, Gnostic texts, like the hypostasis of the archons. Um, they, they tend to denigrate the cosmic order. They elevate vices to the status of virtues, and they affirm the hubris of autotheism, of man becoming God, uh, man uh, basically be, uh, achieving ontological parity with the divine. And Within the uh, narrative framework of these inverted, the, the you know these inverted hermeneutics of these uh, uh, modern myths, we see heroes becoming villains, we see angels becoming demons, we see heaven becoming hell, and we see the the divine being transposed into the human ego. So these are myths in the pejorative sense, but this inversion that we we see it was upheld by several uh, theoreticians who def- defined modernity. Among them was uh, Voltaire, Nietzsche, and of course, uh, Marx. Uh, Pro- Prometheus, for instance, became who of course was the paganized version of Lucifer, became the hero of a uh, revolution. Um, I believe uh, James A. Billington, Billington in his uh, book, uh, uh, Fire in the Minds of Men, um, says that most of the... Uh, the uh, early revolutionaries, the socialist revolutionaries, such as Marx, uh, adhered to uh, a a Promethean myth, uh, a Promethean faith, and that pro- at the heart of that Promethean faith was the uh, conviction that science would lead man out of darkness into light. And of course, this fetishized view of science um, is not. Uh, really, uh, the uh, it's not really the proper view of science. It's it's scientism. It's 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 the a vaunted assessment of science. It's it's uh, the transformation of science into a veritable gnosis, the means by which man achieves a deific status. Um, but we see this uh, uh, we we see this uh, 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 inversionist uh, narrative. On display with the various invocations of the beyond. Uh, the beyond is invoked in our book. We we uh, we cover it in, in I believe four iterations. It, it's invoked as the wrathful earth, earth goddess, um, which is a distortion of God's immanence and the relationship of the feminine to the divine. So, mm-hmm. with with the wrathful earth goddess, that's where we see the uh, the the pantheism. That underpins the radical environmentalist movement, which is uh, becoming explicitly anti-human, mm. uh, which uh, uh, basically uh, deifies uh, the creation, um, and of course uh, demands some recompense for this wrathful Earth goddess, the Gaia, uh, in the form of technological apartheid and uh, population control. Um, the beyond is also uh, invoked as uh, uh, AI and technological uh, singularity, and that's a distortion of God's transcendence. It's it's God's transcendence reinterpreted as the mere circumvention of uh, biological constraints. Um, the humanity uh, uploading itself into uh, a, a, something of a digital pleroma and uh, 
uh, in so doing, uh, basically uh, being able to circumvent the uh, constraints of biology and uh, the constraints of, of physical embodiment, thereby becoming uh, a, a, an incorporeal force that's, uh, uh, that uh, is ontologically, uh, uh, ontologically equal with uh, God. Um, then we have the uh, beyond invoked, invoked as the uh, super weapon, um, and that's basically the Promethean flame reinterpreted as this attainable deific uh, power, um, um, and it, it's 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 a uh, it's uh, a gnostically the the super weapon is this gnostically reinterpreted messiah that will liberate humanity from corrupt materiality. And then, of course, lastly, we crescendo our uh, examination with the beyond invoked as extraterrestrial gods, which is a reinterpreted uh, taxonomy of angels, demons, and uh, other uh, heavenly beings, the most significant of which being um, God. But uh, the uh, beyond its invocation, like I said, is made possible by the... Uh, epistemological revolution that was set into motion by Immanuel Kant. And with Immanuel Kant, what Immanuel Kant managed to uh, erect is what we uh, call the uh, Kantian rift. And that, that neologism is, is what we assign to this epistemological disjunction between phenomena, that is to say the world of appearances, and noumenon, or that is to say the dangon seek, or the thing in itself. And this bifurcation, of course, is imposed upon epistemology by Immanuel Kant, who lived between, I believe, 1724 to 18, uh, 1804. And uh, uh, in Kantian terms, phenomena refers to objects that are discerned through sense perception, which supposedly structures the world uh, in a manner that's potentially disproportionate with reality. So uh, phenomena really amounts to mere appearances. So man can infer only so much from these observable uh, uh, occurrences. He must, however, maintain a, an overall agnosticism and a perennial epistemic incertitude concerning the true nature of those uh, objects portrayed by phenomena. So phenomena are, are really just in platonic terms, the shadows dancing upon the walls of the wall of the cave. They're vague representations of actual objects. In contradistinction, noumenon refers to objects that must be discerned independent of sense perception. And it was with Kant's invocation of this term that we see ourselves uh, confronted with uh, considerable terminological inexactitude because in the pre-Kantian world of ancient philosophy, noumena were they noumena were typically associated with the transcendent order, and they they were typically discerned through intuitive reason. For instance, Platonic ideas and forms those qualify as noumena. Uh, for the Platonic realist Plutus, the forms were thoughts within the minds of God, but. Uh, Kant redefined noumenon as the dangon seek, as the thing in itself, objects as they exist apart from man's potentially deceptive faculties of empirical observation. So according to uh, Kant, humanity's perception of the empirical world is restricted to untrustworthy representations. The noumenal world remains perpetually imperceptible and chaotic, gone is the harmonious cosmos of ancient Greek philosophy, go on is the beautiful creation that God deemed good in the book of Genesis. All that remains is this alien world of appearances. And man can know no experience apart from that which is framed for him by the spatio-temporal uh, matrix. So man becomes this lost cartographer whose mental maps of reality are woefully suboptimal. And so we have an epistemological barrier that severs the adequation between the uh, human mind and reality. And again, this epistemological barrier, we uh, assign it the neologism of the uh, Kantian rift. But with man's consignment to this epistemological prison, um, we, we see the confiscation of a piece of philosophical contraband, 
particularly derided by modernity and that uh philos the the that that uh philosophical contraband is metaphysics um the philosophical discipline of metaphysics of course concerns itself with the discernment of reality's ultimate nature and its structure and of course this discipline is neutered if Kant's uh, position of indefinite epistemic incertitude holds sway. After all, if you, one can only discern the order and structure of reality if their epistemic faculties are trustworthy, but on Kant, they are not. So reality remains you know, eternally unintelligible. And, and even greater ramifications follow from this indefinite epistemic incertitude. The cher cherished metaphysical certainties of the classical era, mm -hmm. the soul, the transcendent order, God, all are relegated to this fog of agnosticism. And this world, it, it, the, the, this world would be inaccessible to an angel announcing salvation. Uh, in fact, no savior could ever redeem such a world or ascend from it. So the slightest intimations of the transcendent have been purged, and all that remains is terra incognita, this chaotic, impenetrable world. So, of course, the world out there rendered as a, a terra incognita, that, that provides the uh, parallel with um, um, the sort of... Uh, the sort of uh, uh, the sort of cosmic order of things, where wherein they can begin to sculpt their own uh, surrogates for the divine, and mm. that's where we see these uh, iterations of the beyond taking shape. That was a great summary. I think that the the process that you're describing reminds me a lot of what Rene Guénon talked about in the Reign of Quantity. Yeah where he says that materialistic scientism cut off the realm of the divine, the understanding of the yeah. soul, soul and God. And then that movement of anti-traditionalism starts since man is a spiritual religious being, his religious impulse has to go somewhere. But since the divine is cut off, it starts like everything comes up from below, he says. So like it, all of these like demonic iterations of, of religious. Yeah. Uh, that, great, that great wall starts to solidify but the cracks appear at the lower level where all the inferior creatures or infra, infra psychic beings would. Exactly. So materialism of... made a vacuum that had to be filled by something. So these deleterious spiritual influences start creeping in. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You, you even see it um, going back um, to 1926 when, um, when, uh, um, uh, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, when he writes his classic now, The Call of Cthulhu, in 1926, in that story, he talks about, you know, this 1907 orgy that's held by this, this cult. He talks about this ritual, which involves uh, an orgy, and they're, and they're basically, they're calling up Cthulhu and all. And um, what you, you come to find out, you know, with further study is that that 1907 ritual did happen. And all, um, the writings, it's, it appears in the writings of none other than Aleister Crowley. And, uh -huh. and every, every feature of that, of that, um, that ritual that appears in Call of Cthulhu also appears in uh, Crowley's description of the, uh, of the ritual that he attended in 1907 from the, <laughs> gigantic black marble to calling up a uh this this uh being from from the from what from the from underwater this you know it's it's all there it's all there but what's happened is what crowley understood to, as as something demonic as something explicitly demonic um Lovecraft reinterprets and takes it and says, well, these are just the old gods that have always existed within the physical realm, you know, and they're extraterrestrial yeah, and they're, they're strictly, sure. strictly objects of a man at experience. Yeah. They're, they're, they, they're, they're not, they're, they're not uh, transcendent in, in the theological sense. Um, um, they, they're strictly objects of a man at experience. They're, they're strictly inhabitants of the ontological confines of the physical universe. But in this regard, his, his you know call to the Cthulhu kind of kind of qualifies as a Roman uh, clave because he's subtly 
and almost allegorically alluding to that Crowleyan uh, ritual. Yeah. Now, did he do this on purpose? Probably not. But that's what he did. That's what I mean. And, and it's obvious that he's used, um, you know, Crowley as some kind of source of inspiration in writing it because yeah. the names are so close. Cthulhu is what he calls this underwater being, this, you know, octopus god of sorts. And, um, you know, whereas Crowley calls it Tutulu. Well, the names are so close that the, the, right. all the different all the different features of the of the uh, ritual from a from a from a hedonistic orgy to this big black marble rock being involved to to to, to the altar everything is the same it's just that hp lovecraft has reimagined it all as being just you know these kind of extraterrestrial beings that are firmly planted on the physical plane and mm -hmm. you know um and and so this is led to um you know this has helped along that trend of people re re-identifying what is clearly diabolical as as being you know something interplanetary something you know um it, it's, it's within it's within the physical realm and and this thus helped along the the, the uh, deception make the deception even worse right and and so we basically see a spiritual realities being uh redefined as uh purely as uh purely uh emanate phenomena physical uh physical quantifiably uh, uh demonstrable phenomena um it's it's kind of like the modern uh the modern understanding of uh magic the modern understanding of magic uh, is that it, it's actually a species of materialism because magic is in fact the the art of teasing out those that by the subplanes of the uh, material order. Um, um, it, it, this is is kind of like the uh, uh, one of the contentions that animates uh, Hermeticism. Um, but it, you see this uh, sort of contention being expressed in films such as uh, Thor, the Marvel film Thor wherein uh, Thor says to uh, uh, Natalie Portman's character, he says, well, uh, in, in your world, you have this bifurcation between science and magic. In my world, they're one and the same. Your ancestors called it magic and you call it science. Well, I come from a place where they're one and the same thing. You know, and that that's kind of the, the modern understanding of of magic there's no there's no transcendent order there's nothing transcendent in the theological sense if, if when when there's talk of transcendence uh transcendence is redefined at, 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 at instead of being outside of the ontological confines of the physical universe it's redefined as moving beyond the constraints of of uh physical reality yeah. Uh, moving beyond uh, all of the cherished constraints of of uh, of uh, 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 the uh, classical era, moving beyond human finitude. Now, there has been periods in history where the jig has almost been up, where the veil was almost ripped away. Um, um, for instance, in 1978, there was a um, a Protestant minister uh, by the name of, of Kurt Co um, Koch. And he wrote a book called The Cult ABC a, um, that started to suggest, look, you know, we need to reevaluate things um, through an interpretational lens used in, in, in antiquity by, by, you know, um, by, by, by the early church in understanding this the, these phenomena. And, you know, and, and he's like, if you look at all the different aspects of, you know, of these um extraterrestrials you know it it closely aligns with what what we understand what the ancient church would have understood to be the diabolic and um then um uh, um seraphim rose father seraphim rose he drew upon both rene gainon and upon uh, kurt coach when he wrote his book, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future, and he fleshed it out even more. And he said, he, you know, he said um, um, that, um, you know, people 
from the medieval period of history, people, you know, uh, that took their religion seriously, you know, back in antiquity, if they, if they had seen the things that we were seeing, they would instantly recognize it as, as the demonic. And, and so that was another time where it was almost that veil almost got, you know, pulled away and we almost saw the, the you know, um, the, uh, the wizard behind the curtain, so to speak. You know, another one would be uh, Jacques Vallée. Back when Jacques Vallée actually wrote a book that wasn't worth more than, you know, just acting as compost, he wrote a book um, called Passage to Magonia, where he, where he points out the fairy folk the gin, all of these things, they closely, closely, you know, align with what, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, ancient people understood to be, uh, be the, de uh, the demonic. So there have been periods where, you know, um, we've almost seen like, um, you know, a reverting back to, uh, to a proper understanding of these, of these phenomena, but it's, but it's never, totally taken and it's never you know been um something where there was like a mass epiphany and people woke up entirely so so you still have especially when you look at all the different um all the different cultural artifacts throughout in in the realm of cinema you still have this this presentation of anything that angelic anything demonic as being extraterrestrial in in nature and um some of this has just been organic but a but a lot of it has actually been you know facilitated by covert political uh, uh covert political forces um you know if if you look at um different um deep state players there are different deep state players that are not just are not just you know involved in the espionage and all the different um, um, covert activities that we associate with the deep state, they're also um, they're also deeply uh, involved in uh, steeped in the occult. Steeped in the occult. Yeah. When E. Howard Hunt, when he decided that he was going to move into the realm of writing novels, like three of his novels, like dealt with the occult, dealt with you know had occult elements to it. You have people like. Uh, John B. Alexander, who was with NIDSI, uh, the National Institute of Discovery Sciences. He worked with uh, with Robert Bigelow, you know, has written a lot over uh, over UFOs and all. And, you know, he was part of the first Earth Battalion, which was like just this this uh, fusion of of the armed services with uh, new age uh, beliefs, you know, pulled from Marilyn Ferguson and from uh, the Aquarian conspiracy. He had his associate, Hal Putoff, who was former Scientologist and involved in remote viewing. You had Michael Aquino, who of course was the founder of Temple of Set. And, you know, of course the Temple of Set had a lot of uh, exotheological additives in it, the God Pantechnicon from outer space and the like, you know, so you have these guys that are, that are both, they're, they're deep state players, but they're, they're, they're normal. They're almost moonlighting as deep state actors. And their main thing is occultism. You, so you have that overlap there. Yeah. I want to underline that idea that you, you do such a great job tracing the strain of these elites for lack of a better term, who basically, make themselves like Plato's guardians of the Republic who, who can like yeah. uh, uh, dictate th the culture. They have this worldview that the physical world is this totally malleable thing. And since they right. have, they have this like privileged secret gnosis, they're the enlightened ones. So they have the power to uh, exact their will and reshape the cosmos in their own image. Um, and that <laughs> that's just, uh, madness <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It, the, the irony they, is they, just they, that that view of that view of uh that view of the material uh of the material uh universe uh was uh set into motion by the scientific revolution the baconian scientific revolution sir francis bacon um who uh was a student of uh, hermeticism of neoplatonism and gnosticism um Sir Francis, Sir Francis Bacon basically divested the cosmos of a telos. He rejected 
a, a teleological structured universe. He rejected teleology entirely. He he felt that uh, teleology had no place in science, and so he uh, expunged teleology and all teleological observations from uh, scientific uh, from scientific uh, uh, endeavors. And in so doing, he rendered uh, the universe uh, uh, completely malleable. He basically transformed it into uh, this uh, lump of clay, or as uh, it would be uh, referred to as Heidegger, Bestand, a standing reserve of malleable material that can be cynically uh, re-sculpted uh, according to uh, according to the uh, the will to power, the the ego, and um, that is basically the mentality that kind of underpins the modern modern understanding of magic as well. That uh, the uh, world is really uh, just this malleable uh, malleable substance that the magician can at will, according to his according to his ego according to his own uh his own apotheosized will can reshape and re-sculpt and that's and, another ironic thing um that you point out is that on the one hand they reject telos and purpose in the world but then they also seem to have this idea that we're evolving towards some kind of transcendent yeah uh, right right it, it's 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 this this bizarre internal contra contradiction on one hand they advance a disteleological view of the cosmos. Um, um, this this disteleological view, which, by the way, echoes very closely the disteleological view of the uh, universe taken by ancient Gnosticism. Of course, ancient Gnosticism held that uh, the the universe was a cosmic abortion, a deceptive simulacrum presided over by archons that uh the uh biblical god uh the jehovah the the creator god was actually uh a, 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 an evil uh demiurge who who created out of uh out of some motivation of the errant will um and that all is all is uh all is just illusory um and and by the way, that that sort of uh, that sort of view, you can see it also. Um, um, you can see here is the detect intimations of it in the epistemological revolution set into motion by Kant. But at any rate, you have this disteleological view of the uh, universe. But at the same time, um, you're saying that this universe is is governed by you know uh, Darwinism. And, and governed by uh, the evolutionary process. Well, the problem is, is that the evolutionary process is in itself irreducibly teleological. It's striving towards a telos that, uh, you know, that all things are, are evolving and developing and, and uh, arriving at a purposive end. It's just not the purposive end that uh, 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 antiquity and the classical era saw for the cosmos. Instead, the purposive end, the telos towards which they see the universe striving, is uh, one that is uh, sculpted according to their ego, according to the will of, to power. They almost need to fall back on that too, when especially when you're dealing with the occultist within deep state circles, the, um, because um, it, it helps them rationalize what they're doing and continue doing what they're doing. Um, if if you if you if you looked at if uh, at the uh, at occultism for, through an honest lens, then you have to admit that you're not the one that's in control. Um, uh, it, it, because what what what's really going on is like that these forces are controlling you are the puppeteers and they're giving you the impression that you're the one behind the driver's seat that you're the one holding the steering wheel and all and um and all you end up really being actually is 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 a puppet that's being um that's being moved uh, you know by by forces with 
to, who dictate the terms. You don't set the terms, they do. And, you know, um, believing, you know, uh, uh, this way, uh, you know, uh, allows these uh, deep state players that are involved in the occult to delude themselves and, and continue to uh, and continue to do these practices because believing this way, you know, p- c- convinces them that they're the ones in control. They can stop whenever they want. You know, they can break, you know, with this whenever they whenever they whenever they please and and you know that's just that's not the way that it what that it that it is and you know um that eventually this is the the re- reality will assert itself and the state deep state actors will have to admit at some point that the tail is wagging the dog and all but um they're they're that's it's not going to happen anytime soon they're 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 because they they've deluded themselves into believing that they're the ones that are uh, that are in control and there's a whole set of of other deep state actors that are working along with them that have what the uh what the guys over on that adhere to what the guys over on psyop cinema call a a metaphysical pragmatism we don't know what's making it work we don't care you know so so hell with it go with it and and do it very cynical view it's a very cynical view they're like we 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 don't know how they're how they're doing it by by god we we can weaponize this we can exploit this so so go ahead make it so make it happen you know and that's just that's going to continue to push things, you know, closer to the precipice of hell. <laughs> you know, it's kind of scary in a certain in a certain respect because what you realize is that uh, is is that the the deep state isn't the um, isn't in control of everything, and that it's forces beyond the deep state that are in control of it. That are that's the overarching, you know, monarchs, so to speak, the puppeteers. Yeah, right? that are the puppeteers yeah. and. You know, and they all ultimately call the tune and they'll determine where it's over. You know, if it was merely, you know, humans, we might be able to actually kind of uh, kind of stop it from reaching its natural ends. But that's not that's not the case at all. You know, so that's a great point. These so these metaphysical pragmatists have convinced themselves that they're they're working towards some positive progress, some kind of. Yeah guiding evolution but it it all it seems like is they're unwittingly building the kingdom yeah. kingdom of antichrist you know they'll sit there and they'll shrug and it, it's like they, they'll have these individuals doing all this remote viewing and and you know which is really ultimately when you get down to where the rubber meets the road it's either an inherent psychic ability that man was not meant to touch, he's not mature enough to and so god turned it off with the fall or it's divination and that's what I believe that in most cases it is. It, it is. It's des, it's divination, which you know Scripture tells us is is um, um, is abhorrent. I believe it uses the actual term abhorrent to refer to it, which shows the severity of it and all. But but you know um, these 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 deep state actors are sitting aloft and saying, "But look at all the intel we've gathered with it. Look at all the lives we've saved on the battleground. Right. You know, look at how many." Uh, you know how many terrorist attacks we were able to stave off, or or uh, you know how we were able to counter all the different moves of other um, of other state players or rogue states, pariah nations. Look at how we were able. You know it, they don't they don't look at the um, at the um, trade offs that are invariably on right. their way. And that's how they try to sell things like Neuralink and and all of these uh, invasive. Uh, yeah. technological things where it's like oh we can cure uh par- paralysis or you know um paralysis right. yeah. and uh, and uh, all these like uh or uh prosthetic limbs for people um but that it's that's just kind of a trojan horse for this they, uh, they turn a blind eye to the do- downside which is yeah. on its way you know christopher knowles who is kind of a social critic uh i i i, I recently read his book uh Amer- the um, the i believe it's called the american the american permanent midnight and he 
he um, and there's lots that I don't agree with him on in the book. And uh, he comes from it from a from a non-Christian perspective mm -hmm. and from a perspective, I think, as as a actually as something of a pr practitioner of the arts or or I think I get the idea. You get the sense when you read the book that he's at least dabbled in the stuff. But he has um, one um, in one of his um, um, chapters, he he talks about uh it, um, two two uh, wizards walking into a bar, and the two wizards sit down. And uh, the one wizard says to the other, "He's like, I've I found this the, this new order that I've joined, and 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 like you know, this is this is it. This is this is finally going to be bring me to the to the pinnacle of the craft." And and so the other ma magician was, is, is says, "Oh, really? Well, tell me about it." And he's like. He's like, well, you know, we take a little bit of this, we take a little bit of that, you know, and and so the other mag magician stops him right there, and he's like, look, you can't just take, you know, one esoteric discipline and mix it with another. You can't just, you know, syncretically blend. You got to take the good with the bad. You got to take, you know, the downsides and the and the and the um, you know the the negatives with the positives. And so that kind of annoys the other magician, but he proceeds and he goes on and he's like, and he's, and, and he says, you know, um, you know, it's, it's has all these benefits and he starts running down all the different benefits and the, the other ma magician stops him again and says, um, so uh, what kind of, what kind of, uh, what kind of sacrifices are you making to ensure that you receive these benefits? To which the other one becomes offended. He's like, what? What are you talking about? I'm a vegan. I don't make sacrifices. <laughs> and so the other one, so the other mag magician that seems to be somewhat grounded in reality says to him, look, if you look from the Canaanites to the, uh, to the Aztecs all going forward, you had to give these people, you had to give these beings something. You have to offer these beings up some kind of sacrifice. And by God, if you don't, they'll they'll extract it from you. You know, they'll take somebody that you don't want them to take, and all. And so the um, the other muse, magician is obviously just mad and exasperated by that. And he says to him, he says, "What are you?" And he's like, "What? What are you? What are you? Are, are you? Are you a? Are you a church lady?" And, he's, <laughs> and so, and the uh, to which the other magician responds. No, I'm a magician. So, you know, <laughs> it's like it's, it, it, even even, you know, the the more sober magicians realize, you know, even the more sober practitioners of the occult, they realize that there is a downside to this that, you know, that you have to accept that there is a a negative aspect to this and that there is something on on par with what the intelligence uh, people in the intelligence realm would call blowback. You got to be ready for the blowback mm. and everything. You know, unfortunately, the vast majority don't see it that way, and so that's why they're just going to continue forging ahead with what they're they're doing. And you know, we 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 have to wait for things to hit bottom for people to finally realize, you know, that shouldn't have been doing this all along. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's move into I want to get to UFOs, but I kind of want to set it up. So we, we've already talked about how these elites want to manipulate the world. They seem to want extreme homogenization and this one world government, one world religion. That's their goal. So they're invoking these categories of the beyond as kind of a, a cudgel to like beat us into line. And that's why there's... Um, yeah, this climate alarmism, the idea of the AI singularity, all of these things are kind of meant to uh, inspire some kind of like fear or like sense of urgency to bring about, you know, policy changes or all of this stuff. And it seems right. and UFOs uh, play into that, all this, this espionage, spycraft, like, and you have so much documentation of all of these things. Um, it's almost hard to figure out where to start with it all. Um, well, we could always start with... Uh... With the, uh, the the you know keep it timely, we could start with maybe the congressional hearings of uh, 2022 and uh, 2023 or yeah well yeah right. we, 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 we we okay so 
Um, what happened with 2022 and 2023 with these congressional hearings is that we moved from a, from one phase to the next, because what's been going on uh, prior to pri prior to those congressional hearings is what um, Charles Upton, who is a perennialist, uh, you know, follower of Rene Gagnon, uh, what he called the um, the uh, government cover up ploy. And what the government cover-up ploy basically holds is that I can convince you that something exists, even if it doesn't exist, by first convincing you that there is an active, an active effort, underway, effort to... underway to suppress that thing, and that's what we see with the with uh, with UFOs. We 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 um, uh, that's how they were able to com to convince people with the with the earlier social engineering efforts that you know extraterrestrials were uh, were um, were real and were visiting the earth is you know they'd uh, they'd um, uh, like uh, manufacture some kind of faux cover up and that would in the mind of the recipient say that would cause the, them to say, well, uh, you know, it, it must be true because it, the government wouldn't go to such lengths to cover this up unless something so profound, something of such gravity and, uh, and weight was there that, that it needed to be concealed. And, uh, and so, you know, that's how they started out. And with the with the uh, 2022 hearings and with the 2023 hearings, they've moved into this new phase of disclosure where the government now it feigns capitulation, it pretends like it's running up the flag of the the white flag of surrender, and all. Well, you finally got us, and now we're begrudgingly giving you the truth, and here it is, and uh, and all the efforts of these quote unquote whistleblowers. Uh, is now starting to uh, to pay off, and uh, one of the individuals who uh, played a role, a uh, main uh, uh, a big role in the um, in this disclosure uh, phase, uh, was presented to the public during the 2023 congressional hearings. It was a um, United States Air Force officer named David Grush, and uh, David Grush he comes with these cred credentials that are causing a lot of people to take what he says seriously, even though his claims, if you listen to his claims, they're really, they seem to be only derivative of overused themes that have been in the UFO community for years and years and years. When, because he, he's, he's asserting that there's a legacy program where, you know, there's been a retrieval of these craft and then reverse engineering of these craft. Everybody is now acting like that's some kind of novel assertion. That assertion has been around since not uh, since since Roswell, actually, you know, um, since whatever crashed in Roswell happened. And, uh, you know, and uh, William Moore and Charles Berlitz himself a member of the intelligence community, uh, you know, uh, wrote the first real book giving us the in extraterrestrial interpretation of Roswell, the, which was the, the Roswell incident. But people are now starting to think that this is actually something new and revelatory, you know, even though it's very old and stale. And if you look at Grush, if you look at who, um, at, at who represents him, it gives you an idea of you know who are the forces behind him, the covert forces that are using him to actually um, to uh, to actually push along this disclosure uh, narrative. And in the debrief article, which where he first appeared, which was written by Leslie King and Ralph uh, uh, Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, um, it it points out that he was represented by uh, Charles McAuliffe the third who is a senior partner at the Compass Rose Legal Group in Washington, in Washington, D.C. And the Compass Rose Legal Group, um, what they are is basically, it, it's more than just a Washington-based national security law firm. That's what they pass themselves off as. But it also appears to be a repository for, uh, for spooks. Andrew Kaj, who founded the, uh, the, that, that legal group, 
um, actually was with the CIA and actually claimed to be a whistleblower himself who had found some um, uh, witness uh, evidence tampering, I believe, in the um, in the um, uh, uh, in the um, attorney, the uh, inside the CIA, and this had led to him uh, facing reprisal and the like. And what what might have we we have no idea if he was really a legitimate w whistleblower or if what was really going on was just some of the internet scene kind of fighting and power struggles that happened in the CIA. But um, if you look at the Compass Rose, the Compass Rose legal group prior to um, to coming to the, the um, to represent uh, Grush. They, re they were involved um, in the uh, 2016, I believe, the first, the first um, uh, impeachment attempt against uh, Donald Trump. And they represented a man by the name of er Eric Sierra Mella, who was the supposed whistleblower who had, you know, told the, who told us about the uh, conversation by between uh, Zelensky and Trump, where Trump supposedly tried to get Zelensky to uh, to provide him with dirt on the uh, on the um, Biden family and their dealings over in the Ukraine, so that he could use them to undermine uh, Biden in the upcoming elections and all. Um, but if you look at like Eric Sierra Mella and you look at Grush and and put them up uh you know one to the to the next and you see that there are some some um some really unsettling uh 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 similarities between the two number one is first of all is is that they if you look into their background you find somebody that's really less of a whistleblower and appears to be more of a political activist that's trying to incite some kind of political change. And second of all, if you look at their testimonies, whether it be Sierra Mella and what he told us about, um, about the Zelensky telephone call or Grush and what he tells us about, you know, these legacy programs, it's all hearsay. It's all hearsay. It's I heard from a dude who heard from a dude who heard from a dude and all, you know, and, and so, you know, um, uh, what, what, what it appears to us is what is, is that, um, that Compass Rose legal firm is actually kind of a deep state legal appendage. And, and so, you know, um, this this suggests to us that what's going on here is not really disclosure, but the attempt to use hearsay and pass uh, uh, um, hearsay testimony and pass it through uh, an individual that they have arbitrarily labeled as whistleblowers to the American public to get them to to further along social engineering. And, you know, to what to, to what end? Well, they want. Well, I think that uh, Grush put it best in either in either the debrief article. It was either the debrief article or the article written subsequent to that by Michael Schellenberg, where he says that he wish it, where he says at the very end of the article that he wishes to impose, quote unquote, ontological shock. And also, you know, he's actually a, a an on, ontological shock trooper. And well, also, ontological shock, of course, involves the demolition of worldviews, the complete and total undermining of the uh, hermeneutic according to which one understands the world. And that's mm -hmm. uh, so at the that's also at the heart of uh, psychological warfare. Of course, psychological warfare that. Uh, appellation it was derived from uh, the German word Weltanschauungskrieg, which means world warfare. It is the uh, destruction of of Weltanschauung of a worldview of the interpretive lens through which one understands the world, the prism through which one understands uh, the world around them uh, and the relations among nations, 
And that's the, the purpose served uh, by an, uh, an ontological shock to completely and totally eradicate uh, the pri that prism so as to introduce a, a new hermeneutic, a, a new uh, interpretive tradition according to which reality will be understood. So they're, they're using this uh, UFO myth to kind of initiate the public into a new uh, religious paradigm um how would you characterize why they're doing that for like what or what it's moving towards well um um the the with 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 this the, the new religion that's intimated by the by this uh ufo myth um is one where uh humanity humanity is but one more biological appendage of the kaza suai self-generating universe and um, aliens, uh, extraterrestrials, allegedly uh, evolved out of the primordial soups of that universe. And these uh, beings uh, who traverse the expanse separating celestial bodies, which has now been uh, deemed uh, the new eschaton. It's, uh, we've seen the transposition of the eschaton into that expanse, into space, uh, qualify as deific beings and because we are evolutionarily related to them because we emerged from the very same primordial soups of the very same Kaza Suwai universe that they inhabit um we must be in, in, in the very set through the very same evolutionary processes arriving at uh at uh apotheosis mm. at, at a glorious transfiguration where humanity slays its humanity in a Nietzschean sense, moves beyond its uh, humanity and becomes God. Wow. The, the, the lie in the garden reiterated yeah. is what, is what we, is what we have here going on. And, um, and, and um, does Grush realize he's being used in this way? Um, there's some question as to whether he does uh, or doesn't uh, because he, he he seems to have even contemplated at one point the possibility that the UFO information that he had received from all these different interviews that he was doing with intelligence officials um, was all lies. I mean, like he did an interview on News Nation, uh, you know, around the same time that the debrief article came out. And he said, he said, quote unquote, I thought it was totally nuts. I thought at first I was being deceived. It was a ruse. Unquote. I thought it was totally nuts. And I thought at first I was being deceived. It was a ruse. I remember interviewing these personnel. Uh, I'm like, any, any of these people are lying to me. We're having a psychotic break or this is some crazy, but true stuff that's happening. And I have no good explanation. That's prosaic at all for this. And somehow, you know, he was able to overcome his doubts and release his so-called revelations. And, you know, so did he actually come to believe the intelligence officials that he had, you know, that he had spoken to because the intelligence officials obviously never lie, you know, um, but, you know, being facetious there, or did he decide to willingly participate in this disinformation campaign and all? Um, that last statement that he made at the very end of the article where he said that he hoped to impose ontological shock, that seems to suggest to me that he, he decided to engage uh, uh, to, you know, with full knowledge in the lie because he regarded the lie to be a noble lie, to be the noble lie. And that actually, you know, breaking down, you know, um, the systems of belief that are currently in place in the world was actually something noble and would, you know, lead to a, a system of belief that would be actually much more advantageous to humanity. And also, you know, that's, it's possible that he knows exactly what he's doing. And another thing is that whenever he's called upon, whenever he was called upon, I watched, I watched uh, large portions of the, uh, of the uh, hearings, whenever he was called upon, and, and this goes back to the whole hearsay, um, you know, the fact that it's that it's all hearsay. 
whenever he was called upon to bring evidence forward to support what he was saying, he's like, I'd like to move to a skiff. I'd like to move to a skiff. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Now what a skiff is, is that that's a, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the acronym, uh, you know, accurately. It's uh -huh. like a secret compartmentalized information facility. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what it is. So it's kind of like going into executive session. He wants to move over to to kind of an executive session where he, you know, um, where he divulges this information in confidence with only, you know, only the uh, congressional participants and, and lawyers are present and everything. Well, what good does that do the public? And how does the public know that what he's saying is, is, um, is true? How, Maybe, maybe if he does devolved, if he released it in the public hearings, as opposed to in a skiff, then the public would find it to be so flimsy and so weak that this whole thing would fall apart instantaneously. Uh, he doesn't want it, it can't fall apart just yet. Mm. You know, it, it, it has to do its job as a, as a, as as a solvent as an as an acid that eats away at our at our our, our systems of belief hmm. so you know let's have it be a skiff you know let's let's have that those revelations uh come out those disclosures come out in the skiff at first and just let you know just let the assertions you know, play, run wild and wreak havoc on what people believe. You know, these all these n ridiculous assertions. We found non-human biologics at crashes, yeah. stuff like that. Which, uh, incidentally, and that I found that to be hilarious because he doesn't say extraterrestrial bodies. He says non-human biologics. Right. Yeah. Well, a monkey is a non-human <laughs> biologic, and we've been eating <laughs> monkey. You know, that's how the, that's how the space program. That's that's how at least the above ground space programs got started. You know, it was shooting monkeys in the space. You know, so you know it could be anything. It could be a dog. It could be a uh, it could be a shaved orangutan. You know, it it could be just about anything. You know, and and but but what he's hoping is by putting that out there that you know that will be yeah, enough the, the to public, shake. Yeah, the public mind will draw its own conclusions. Yeah, mm -hmm. on the basis of presuppositions that have been engendered over years and years of indoctrination through sci-fi films, uh, through yeah. uh, uh, they, they, uh, the promulgation of uh, ufological literature and and the uh, popularization of uh, certain theoreticians like Stanton Friedman and what uh, of the field and the the public imagination will simply do the rest with these fairly ambiguous and nebulous uh terms yeah. that he uh continues to uh just release into the ethos we, we'll go to work our imaginations will go to work on the quote-unquote revelations and something yeah. punctuated equilibrium will happen and uh, the the person that sits there and hears him talking about non-human biologics that really doesn't have a, uh, is you know doesn't have a critical eye on this whole thing will say mm -hmm. what maybe it's true maybe 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 what the, what what miss clary was teaching me was saying at sunday school has been all a lie <laughs> you, know? you know by the time it comes out that this was all gas it's too late. You've already, mm. you know, you've already disassembled. Yeah, the, your the meme has been, the meme has been planted in the mind. The ideational contagion is released, and uh, people are beginning to think uh, and interpret reality as you had hoped they would. See, because the way that I think that this will play out, the 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 pattern that I think that it will follow is if. Um, um, much like what happened with the Holloman la uh, UFO landing. Did you ever look and have heard about that one? Um, um, maybe. Re you refresh my memory on that one. Okay. Um, supposedly, this, these emissaries from another world land and met with um, emissaries from our world here, you know, and at, at an Air Force base. And um, it, it really the myth got started when um, Robert Emenager was uh, putting together a UFO documentary. I believe that it was called UFOs Past, Present, and Future. 
And he had been promised by the United States Air Force actual film of this Holloman landing that had supposedly happened. And um, so he's excited and he starts putting this <laughs> He starts putting this documentary together and it's getting closer and closer to completion, getting closer and closer to time of release. And he's there with, you know, he's there with the Air Force after they've made all these these grandiose kind of promises. And, all, you know, you're going to get this and it's going to be earth shattering. And it's like it's it's a it's a piece of history, you know, right up there with the Zabruder film, you know, it's, it's it, and he's like, OK, all right. Where is it? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And they never gave him anything. He ended up having to go to an artist's depiction of the Holman landing, which appeared in the film and all, uh, which which made, you know, which made it just a laughing stock. Mm-hmm. You know, um, never received any any kind of film whatsoever and all. But but, you know, but it didn't matter. Because that Holloman myth was now out there. It was now out in the ether to do, you know, and and the uh, the imaginations of the UFO community, which is perfectly capable of deceiving themselves at times. Yeah. Right. Uh, went to work on it. Went to work on it. So, you know, those, those the deep state and public state forces within the United States Air Force, you know, um, got, their des- got their desired effect. Mm. I think we're going to see the exact same thing with David Grush. They'll drag this out for a while. They'll drag yeah. this out for a while. But eventually this guy is going to be told, okay, put up or shut up. But when it comes time to uh, put up, uh, put up, uh, up, you know, he's either going to disappear, you know, become mysteriously silent and all, or he'll give people something that so ridiculous. So, you know, I, I don't know, like, uh, 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 UAVs pre- performing some kind of aerial maneuver, and oh, look at that! That's a, which is what I think ultimately the Tic Tac films from the USS Nimitz. Mm. I uh, that's ultimately what that is. I believe is UAVs. Mm. You know, uh, you know, he'll give us something like that that can uh, that will be shot down by every single. Uh, uh, photographic analyst out there, every single cinematographer out there. Remind me what a UAV is. Oh, an unmanned aerial vehicle. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. A drone. Mm -hmm. They've been playing a role in this deception forever and a day. If you go back to the Paul Benowitz affair. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, yeah, where Paul Benefits was was basically driven to nervous exhaustion by all that that William Moore and the aviary and uh, the AFOSI were feeding him and all, but it, uh, UAVs played a role in that because uh, Ro- um, Richard Doty flew him over what, what, what he alleged was the site, was a crash site of, for UFOs uh, of, a, of, a, of an extraterrestrial craft. And what it was most likely, and all, when you look at the pictures that, you know, Benowitz sketched off of what he had seen, is it was more likely a, a UAV prototype in the early developmental stages. Mm. So, I mean, like these UAVs have been playing a role in it, in, in the deception forever and a day. But that's what a grudge will ultimately do. He'll, he'll, he'll produce, produce some of the most subpar evidence or just shut up altogether and just disappear. Right. So this yeah. idea of the quote unquote noble lie seems to be the crux of all of this. Uh yeah, could you there are those famous quotes that you cite of like Reagan and MacArthur and all these people saying, like, if only we had this extraterrestrial threat to unite the world, yeah. uh, if only we had something to inspire um, this homogenization. And you uh, I think, Philip, you recently on Twitter posted this article about Avi Loeb, the, the yes. Harvard. Yes. Where he says basically the same thing where he's like, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll discover these neighbors. We'll see them as gods and, and they'll That's inspire right. us. Uh, the Avi, Avi Loeb is directly patched in with these deep state actors that are doing it. His Galileo project has on it Christopher Mellon and Christopher Mellon's family has been involved in uh, in intelligence since the formation of the OSS, going back to Paul Mellon and um, several other uh, Mellons, the Hitchcocks, which the Hitchcocks are basically an appendage of the Mellon family, and Louis Elizondo, 
uh, who it was also introduced to the public by the same journalist that introduced David Grush to the public, uh, Leslie Kane. Leslie Kane tries to play herself up as a humble, lowly journalist that, you know, is just tenacious and, and you know, hardworking, gets to the, the, the yeah, meat of a story. A legitimate truth all. seeker. Yeah. Her family is the Kane family, the Kane political dynasty. Her uncle, uh, um, uh, her uncle is actually um, the Kane the, who founded the Kane Commission, the 9-11 Commission, who headed up the 9-11 Commission. And, and he even, you know, has said that the 9-11 Commission was a sham and was, quote unquote, set up to fail. And, you know, if he's if he is so, you know, if he's involved in um, in fa pu pushing false narratives, then you know the likelihood that his niece is involved in uh, in uh, pushing false narratives has to be has to be considered as well. But she also introduced us to Lou Elizondo, who was claiming to head up um, a, a tip within the Pentagon, and you know there and. Um, if you look at if you look at Lou Elizondo's background, Lou Elizondo's father, Lou Elizondo, because he's Lou Elizondo the fourth. His father, Louis Elizondo, uh, Lou Elizondo the third, was a member of Brigade twenty five zero six, which was the brigade that was involved in the Bay of Pigs landing, and the Bay of Pigs landing uh, was um, was organized largely by a man named E. Howard Hunt, which was considered to be one of the penultimate covert operators. He's who he's who Ethan Hunt is from um, Mission Impossible is mm, based uh. off of and everything. But E. E. Uh, but e. Howard Hunt was was very, very close with the Cuban exiles that were part of the Brigade 2506. And in and um, E. Howard Hunt is also known to have been a UFO disinformation agent because he passed along to Douglas Caddy, who was the lawyer for the for the Watergate burglars for a short period of time, that you know that um, that JFK had been killed to conceal quote unquote the alien presence. Mm -hmm. So he was able to insert you know the whole notion that JFK was killed to hide an extraterrestrial presence here on earth. He was able to insert that into the lore through, uh, through Douglas Caddy among other people. So, you know, so it looks like Lou Elizondo is just, uh, you know, an intergenerational, you know, member of this, uh, of this disinformation effort. And all of these guys, uh, Lou Elizondo, uh, Christopher Mellon, and, probably at some point, David Grush, not yet, but at some point, will find themselves, you know, coalescing around Ave Loeb, this Galileo project. I mean, like Millen and Elizondo are already there. And mm -hmm. also, I mean, like, so uh, uh, Ave Loeb is, is not just, you know, a, a, a kind of eccentric kind of physicist or something. He's actually part of these covert political circles. Right. As Paul mentioned Avi Loeb, of course, he's a theoretical physicist, and he's the founder of the Galileo Project for the Systematic Scientific Search for Evidence of Extraterrestrial Technological Artifacts. Now, as that rather verbose designation suggests, the project's objective is to search for physical items related to alien technology. And uh, according to its uh, the uh, project's official website, the proposition animating this ambitious undertaking is, and I'll quote verbatim for the edification of the audience, quote, humans can no longer ignore the possible existence of extraterrestrial technolo technological civilizations or ETCs, and that science should not dogmatically reject potential extraterrestrial explanations because of social stigma or cultural preferences, factors which are not conducive to the scientific method of unbiased empirical inquiry, unquote. So in hopes of overcoming the supposed social stigmas and cultural preferences that have burdened potential extraterrestrial explanations, the Galileo Project examines the UFO phenomena uses, using the standard scientific method based on a, a transparent analysis of open scientific data 
to be collected using optimized instruments. Um, so it's it's supposedly a more legitimate approach to studying the phenomena. Uh, according to Loeb, this approach differentiates the Galileo project from the investigative efforts of the fringe. But but ironically, Loeb uh, still promotes several of the beliefs held by the fringe, chief among which is the alternate uh, creatology dubbed directed panspermia, which contends that terrestrial life was deliberately seeded by alien civilizations. And Loeb uh, argued in support of this thesis in a research paper entitled uh, Possible Transfer of Life by Earth Grazing Objects to Exoplanet Systems, and he also argued for it in an opinion piece entitled uh, Noah's Spaceship, a conspicuous, uh, a conspicuous allusion to the biblical Noah. But of course, within the framework of this creatology, the creatology of directed panspermia, aliens become the de facto gods of a self-sufficient emanate order. Yet this intramundane divinity more closely resembles the god of Gnosticism than it does the god of Christianity. Like the absolutely transmundane father of the Gnostics, alien deities never once solly themselves with the actual act of creating. Uh, instead, they decide to create a new race of gods from pre-existing matter. So they never, they never actually create something. They, they never actually create. They create using a pre-existing substance, which was what the Gnostics uh, held. The Gnostics held that the real God, the true God, the transmundane father would never have created anything because such an act was an errant act uh, because they basically, they basically view, they, they basically assigned a positive ontological status to corruption, to evil, that conflated the curse which afflicted creation with creation itself. It, it would be analogous to uh, basically conflating a tumor with the cancer patient. Um, so they they basically ontologized evil, and in, in so doing, they made of the creation this uh, evil simulacrum, and um, from that from that uh, that creatological conviction they arrived at this masotheism they indicted god the the biblical god as uh evil because true surely this a good god would never have created an evil creation mm. but um this new creatology this creatology of directed panspermia it raises more questions than it answers but uh, loeb nevertheless believes that man's contact with this ensemble of extraterrestrial divinities will result in a grand synthesis of science and religion. And, and he states, and again, I'll quote him for verbatim for the edification of the audience. How can we unify religion and science? By finding AI astronauts from a scientific civilization that is far more advanced than we are. The Galileo Project aims to search for extraterrestrial equipment near Earth. The question remains, did God in its religious or scientific interpretations, create humans in its image, or did humans imagine the concept of God in their mind? The Galileo Project can address the scientific context of this question. Now, there are two problems with Loeb's statements. First of all, Loeb posits some dialectical tension between science and religion. We, we've heard this all before, uh, that, that science and religion are somehow dichotomously related. They are not necessarily dichotomously related. At least that is the case for Christianity, which affirms several presuppositions upon which the, the natural sciences rely. Chief among uh, those assumptions is that the universe is intelligible. And of course, intelligibility suggests the involvement of a some rational agent in the creation of the universe. Uh, unlike the universe, that agent would not exist contingently. Um, it, it, the, the, the agent could not exist contingently. If that agent did exist contingently, then that agent would amount to little more than one connective sinew in this infinite regress of finite physical causes. And of course, an infinite uh, regress progressively diminishes an explanatory power as the chain of contingencies extends into infinity. So in, instead, 
a first cause would have to transcend the ontological confines of the physical universe and exist independently of any other causative forces. Christianity calls such agent God. And not surprisingly, scientific research was actually promoted by the uh, and under the guidance of a uh, medieval scholastic theologian. So ultimately, there is no reconciliation required between science and the Christian faith. Second, the second problem with Loeb's statement is that it is not quite clear why the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe would result in the unification of otherwise the spirit scientia, or that is to say, bodies of knowledge. It's even less likely that aliens will somehow unite disparate religions with all of their differing theological, soteriological, and eschatological claims. As much as the religious universalist may object, all faiths hold uh, certain non-negotiable tenets and at bottom are exclusivistic. Yet it's Loeb's conviction that aliens boast the requisite spiritual insights to conduct this ultimate project in syncretism. And herein is a non sequitur uh, endemic to space religions. This non sequitur is the proposition that aliens are spiritually enlightened by virtue of the fact that they occupy off-world habitations for no other reason, no other reason than geographical karma extraterrestrials are automatically regarded as the possessors of some sort of gnosis. And in turn, the possession of this gnosis has supposedly facilitated the apotheosis of its interplanetary practitioners. Just just as some uh, ancient pagan cultures ascribe deific uh, qualities to rocks and trees, the modern pagans of space religion transpose the divine into the expanse that separates celestial bodies into space. And because extraterrestrials traverse that uh, expanse, allegedly, uh, in technologically advanced craft, they are equally apotheosized, the chariots of the gods. This apotheosis is ex exemplified by the pseudo-theological musings of Loeb, who argues that uh, a scientifically advanced civilization would eventually mirror the divine. And those are his own words. As a matter of fact, he says, and I quote, a sufficiently advanced scientific civilization might be able to create synthetic life in its laboratories. In fact, some of our terrestrial laboratories almost reached that threshold. And with a good understanding of how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity and advanced scientific civilization, could potentially create a baby universe in its laboratory. Therefore, an advanced scientific civilization might be a good approximation of God, unquote. In, in an upcoming uh, documentary that, uh, entitled uh, God versus Aliens, um, Loeb basically predicts that extraterrestrials will probably make contact with artificial intelligence before they'll make contact with humanity. Uh, uh, he basically says that aliens, if aliens visit us, uh, of course, they will use their AI systems to interface with our AI uh, systems. And uh, they might actually develop a kinship towards our AI systems. Uh, so you know, humanity will play a very minimal, minimal role in, uh, in uh, this uh, mediating with the, uh, with, extraterrestrial visitors wow. but yeah. yeah now assume for a moment that there are very real extraterrestrials just assume that for a moment you know um it, it, they're not going to be anything like what avi loeb envisions or any of the uh past thinkers who in, influenced his view of it you know um uh here's the way that a christian would understand you know assuming they're real and I don't believe they are. We're 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 getting close to people finding out that that there that this has just all been gas, and and you know these disinformation agents and all they've been propping it up. Uh, these deep state actors have been propping it up with uh, popsicle sticks and 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 paste, and you know and and and, and that's eventually going to going to come out. Um, but assume for a moment that it, it is uh, that 
there are extraterrestrials out there. How would a Christian understand it? Well, you know, we, we understand that Jesus Christ had two natures, human nature and, uh, and, and divine. Yeah, the he's hypostatic full, yeah. union. He's fully God and he's fully human. Okay. He doesn't have a Venusian nature. He doesn't have a Martian nature. He doesn't have a theta reticulant nature. So if these extraterrestrials are real, they're us. They're other humans. They're other humans. And thus, just as confused and just as spiritually messed up as we are. Yes, they're, they're, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't come possessing any kind of, of um, elevated gnosis or having any kind of illumination no, or no enlightenment. Real, yeah, no they real would be, spiritual insights, no more than we yeah, had. They would be just as screwed up in the need of redemption as we would, as, as we are. You know, they they come with all the same uh all the same flaws and shortcomings that that we have. And you know, so, you know, um uh, this uh, the, this the, what he what he is presenting what Avi Loeb and the deep state coteries around him are presenting is so far removed from from reality so far removed from from a, a sound understanding of spiritual issues that you know when 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 the crash comes when we when when we realize that either there's no aliens at all or they're just other flawed humans and who knows how they got up there, but you know, but the crash is going to be so hard that it'll probably it'll probably be on par with the great disappointment that was uh, experienced by the millenarians back in the 1800s. You mm. know, it's, it's going to be a complete downer on, 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 for these people. Um, you know, um, and, and um, with, with the current disclosure, um, a trend that we see that's being perpetrated by these deep state actors. Uh, the fact that the Compass Rose legal firm is behind it suggests that there's going to be the same modus operandi that we saw with the first impeachment of, of Donald Trump, where everything looks damning at first. Everything looks really compelling. We're going to have the same kind of highs and lows. We got them this time. We got them. And then you see that it's just a bunch of hot air. I mean, like with mm -hmm. Eric Sierra Mella, with Eric Ciela, Sierra Mella, we, we, they, they, they presented him off as having damning testimony. And then it ended up to be hearsay that he got from Alexander Vindman, who was himself pulling from a... Uh, pulling from a conversation summary that he had made where he added things in to make it look worse than it really was. We're, we're going to have something similar with, with David Grush, where it's going to look very damning. It's going to look very compelling. And then as time wears on, we're going to see where things were added in. We're going to start seeing the, um, the half truths. We're going to start seeing the contradictions, and it's going to steadily pull things pull things apart. You so know? yeah, you think it's all these all this deception is just going to collapse under its own weight? Yeah, yeah, I mean the only thing that can keep it going for much longer than what it than than its than its um, assigned lifespan would be literally like a false flag kind of um, uh, some some kind of cosmic gulf of Tonkin, so right? To yeah, a fake invasion or something yeah, like that. Yeah, fake invasion. Yeah. You know, they they use UAV technology or something something on par with it and um you know, a, I don't know, attack a ship in the South China Sea. And you know, and there's casualties involved and in in the um in the aftermath initially you have some blaming of maybe China or Russia or some some foreign agent and, you know, then they start to say, but wait, there's more. And, you know, no, it couldn't be them. And so they start, you know, um, presenting some kind of case for uh, this ship having been attacked by by craft from another world. That's the only way they could get any kind of more. They could get any far more traction out of it than they yeah. than they will. 
if, if yeah, I may yeah. also say too, um, I, I I know that most 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 of us most of us are not you know most of us are not students of philosophy, but the the human mind ne- nevertheless you know being you know gifted to us by God and everything does have a uh, does have the uh, propensity for uh, philosophically deliberating certain questions even if it doesn't employ the highly technical <laughs> vernacular of philosophy. And, and a, a lot of people are beginning to, to see the logical insolvencies that pervade the uh, alien narrative. There's two key uh, uh, non sequiturs, uh, well, actually three. Um, the first non sequitur is that every unidentified object in the sky must be an alien craft. There's lots of aerial phenomena we can't explain, but it doesn't logically follow from the premises that it's automatically craft from another planet piloted by extraterrestrials. Mm. It, it could be any number of, of, of uh, phenomena. It could even be the, uh, some phenomena that uh, the ufological community and the overall just the materialistic West would not wish to countenance. And that could be uh, miraculous. That could be, you know, signs in the heavens, presented by God. Uh, the second uh, non sequitur is the non sequitur that by mere virtue of their own geographical circumstances, by just by geographical karma alone, the uh, that said beings would be in possession of some gnosis of not just not just technological and scientific insights mind you but spiritual insights as well well it doesn't logically follow from the premises that because a being comes from another planet light years away that it would have spiritual insights that we wouldn't perhaps technological and scientific insights sure uh, it, obviously, if it developed a propulsion system that could bring it here, but it doesn't logically follow from the premises that it knows anything more about spiritual realities than we do. And then the third non sequitur is that 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 is that given the immensity of space, that the, it, 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 it there must be there must be life elsewhere in it. I, I call this the argument from potential uh, potential occupancy. Uh, let me explain. <laughs> What I mean by that, the the uh, the argument from potential occupancy goes like this: uh, I I I see a house with five rooms. Ergo, there must be five people living in that house. Well, does it logically follow from the premises that there must be five people living in a house just by virtue of the fact that it has five rooms? What if one of those rooms is a bathroom? What if one of those rooms is a basement? What if one of those rooms? You know, is is I, uh, I, I converted uh, this into my man cave. Yeah, this is my pantry, <laughs> yeah. and it, it doesn't logically follow from the premises that because there is the potential for occupancy of those five rooms, that there must be five people there. Mm. Likewise, just because space is immense, it doesn't logically follow from the premises that there must be other life in it. Perhaps space is immense, and again, this is a view. This is a, a, this is a, a, a Christian view that wouldn't be, you know, countenanced by the materialistic West or the ufological community. Perhaps it's immense because God meant for it to be, but, but meant for it to be populated by us, for us to 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 uh, populate it, for us to reach out into it, to have inhabit it. Those are those are those are you know just the three uh, uh, non sequiturs that you see pervading the UFO narrative, and you know the the these these non sequiturs are becoming more and more uh, pronounced as we go along, um, and 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 it's just becoming more and more obvious to people. So like at some point to just continue to breathe life into it, they probably would need something large, some kind of catastrophic event like a like a, a a false flag uh, because again i mean like people might think it's weird me suggesting look at that first impeachment of donald trump to see w- the pattern to see the pattern with this whistleblower and all but actually i mean like when you follow the whistleblower quote unquote eric Mellis rise and fall it looks mighty an awful lot like eric grush because First of all, Sierra Mella passed himself off as a dispassionate civil servant who was just doing his civic duty. And then we found out 
that no, actually, he's been talking to people on the National Security Council about how he can't stand this new president and this new president needs to be removed. And also, he's not a whistleblower. He's, uh, he's an activist. He's an activist. Yeah. Second off, he supposedly has damning evidence that this this president stepped beyond you know his his presidential duties, and 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 then the evidence proves to be hearsay because he didn't he didn't hear it himself he heard it from another political activist which would uh, was uh, Alexand Alexander Vindman who you know doctored up sexed up his summary of the telephone conversation you know we're going to see this with with Grush because. Grush is trying to pass himself off again, again, as a dispassionate, as a as a dispassionate truth teller that's just doing his civic duty. But at the end of that article where he says he wants to bring about ontological shock, it's obvious that he's not a dispassionate truth teller. He has an agenda of his own. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's and the assassin of the, an assassin of worldviews, so of classical yeah. worldviews. So he's an activist parading, masquerading around as a whistleblower, just like Eric Sierra Mella. And then, second of all, hearsay again. Did you see any of this stuff? He never saw any aliens. He never touched an alien craft. He never touched any artifacts. He never has come in contact with any uh, any uh, any debris. And all it's all hearsay. Oh, I did interviews with other intelligence officials. Well, oh, okay, intelligence officials never lie. You know, again, going back to that, and all you know, it, it, it could never, it never dawned on you that they might just be pulling your leg, and all. So it's the same thing with him as it was with Eric C. Aramella. So it's going to hit highs and lows like it did with the impeachment, and all, and then just come crashing down. Unless they, again, unless they have some kind of catastrophic event that where the aliens aren't real, but the violence and the, and the casualties are mm -hmm. carry it a little bit further and all, you know, and, and even that at a certain point will only carry it so far. I mean, how long was it, how long was it after, you know, uh, the Bay of Pigs? That I mean, not the Bay of Pigs. Sorry, the the Gulf of Tonkin. That people began questioning the narrative that got us involved in a South East Asian conflict where there isn't any real American national security imperative. Mm -hmm. And all. well, you had you had LBJ shortly after saying, "For all I know, they were shooting at whales." You know, it, it, so it it fell apart really quick there. And so you know, any any kind of hypothetical uh you know uh uh false flag that we see involving extraterrestrials probably fall apart you know at the same rate you know at the same uh rate we see the same rate of entropy with with that with that one you know so so yeah you know it's it's not it's not going to last it it'll do its damage as far as what kind of damage it'll do you know i think yet you could look to somebody like Paul Benowitz as your model. And all again, he was lied to in so many ways. He was lied to in about Jesus as part of it. They told him that Jesus was a, was a spaceman. Yeah, mm -hmm. Richard yeah. Cody passed the same sort of uh, exotheological portrayal of Christ along to Linda Malton Howe as yeah, well. Yeah, but you know what ended up happening? Nervous exhaustion, which is kind of a clinical word for a nervous breakdown. Yeah, so just, a mass nervous breakdown. A you know, nervous they breakdown find, they on found him level. in found him in his house, barricaded in his house, just unable to function. Hadn't been eating, had been chain smoking, everything. So that's what the end result would be. Again, on a mass scale, we just have a a whole swath of the population just you know hit nervous exhaustion. Well, where the, they, the pop would never lock itself down would it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's really not hard to imagine a scenario like that and then obviously this isn't their only card to play so they've got the ufos they've got what you were just referring to with you those lockdowns wanna, you, you, you don't want to risk you don't want to risk getting zapped by an alien so get your curbside delivery of, <laughs> right yeah. of olive garden <laughs> 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 Your soup salad and breadsticks will be at the door and you don't have to worry about the photon rays. That <laughs> right. Yeah. That grab and go guy will take the risk for you. Yeah. <laughs> so.
So, but yeah, like you said, there's lots of different contingencies that, they, you know, ultimately they all fail and everything. They just, mm -hmm. they, a lot of people, unfortunately, are collateralized along the way, you know. Um, and we saw that again with COVID. We've seen people, this, this unproven substance is now in their veins and they still got COVID. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. don't know why they're getting brain fog or this cancer, this returning. Myocarditis, or, you know, periocarditis, you yeah. know. I, I, I never had problems with clots before. What's going on now? You know, or, or must be the climate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, are, these, are these children with these horrible, like learning disability? I mean, like they're a year mm -hmm. set back. They're set back by at least a year in their learning, you know? Yeah. And so it'll be the same thing again. We'll, it'll, it'll all fall apart, but like people will have been collateralized by it. And, and so we will see some kind of, you know, horrible suffering as a result. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the big picture of the, this like evolution, they think that they're guiding humanity through towards this like transcendence. And like you brought up like the Nietzschean slaying of man so that we can become the Ubermensch over man. It's, it, it seems like an ultimately suicidal impulse that is yes. just going towards destruction and chaos. Um, and that's like, it ends in hell <laughs> eventually. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. 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 That's, that's about, that's a very good way of summing it up. And yeah. I, and with the UFO social engineering, we see what we've seen with evolution and with everything before it, again, pushing that primary mover back out, just keep them back out, back out. Well, yeah. they seeded us. Somebody seated them. Yeah, the infinite and then, regress. And, and the infinite yeah. regress. And how long but can that, they? How long can they keep on yeah. pushing the unmoved mover out? You can only have, you you can only have so many box cars. So yeah, it's cars. it's turtles all the way down, but aliens all, all the way, way up. Eventually, yeah. you're going to have to have that <laughs> locomotive that has the principle of motion inherent in it. You're going to have to. Mm -hmm. And now what they would like to say is the locomotive. The locomotive is us because they follow in the in you know, in, in the footprint, in the footsteps of, of the Bavarian Illuminati, which held that God was not in the beginning, but God will be in the end. Right. You know, so we're, well, and you see that, you see that with, uh, the, so we're seeing, the po yeah. we're seeing the posthumous, right. Uh, influence of Adam Weishaupt that, and, and his, his, that, you know, little depraved right. sect there, you know, that's yeah. the thing that a lot, a lot of people don't understand about, about atheism. Um, um, atheism actually, and Feuerbach points this out, um, um, Feuerbach uh, points out that atheism at bottom is autotheism. It arrives at a theos. It arrives at a god. Um, this is made evident by the epistemological entailments of atheism. In order to reject the existence of a being in possession of infinite knowledge of omniscience, one has to lay claim to omniscience or infinite knowledge. So, so, so in, in our, re, in the rejection of God, one is, a, is adopting a quality of God. One is adopting a deific trait. And um, um, we, we already, we, we, we already see, we, we see with, with uh, the, uh, the uh, alien narrative and directed panspermia, the, this, the intimations of an intramundane divinity being insinuated in. Um, if we were seated by these beings who evolved at, uh, just as we did out of the primordial soups of this Kasasuai self-generating universe, then surely we will become as they are. Yeah, but you can't you can't keep on pushing that unmoved mover out no. of the picture in hopes of displacing them and no. you know eventually which eventually he will assert himself just right. to show that he's still right. Uh, yeah, uh, the the way you described the the deception, the UFO deception crumbling under itself, all of Satan's lies will also have the same fate, and yes. tr truth will prevail in the end. So absolutely, and you notice that. Satan is really not a very original thinker because all of this is really just a parody of uh, a parody of theosis. The uh, theosis in contradistinction to apotheosis, apotheosis posits the commingling of human essence with the divine, ontological parody with God. In contradistinction, and, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, uh, as Orthodox Christians, theosis involves 
be, become, it becomes becoming by grace what he is by nature, but we never in our natures become what he is. Mm -hmm. God will remain God, capital G, God. We will be image bearers, reflections of him, which is truly the end point towards which we should strive. That is the true transfiguration of humanity. But that's what the, the deviant elite is parodying, and that's what their it, 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 that Satan, as their puppet master, is parodying is is theosis. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that seems like a great thing to end on. I've yeah. lost track of time. I think we're about Sorry. three hours in or something. No, it's great. It's it's, great. it's it's been amazing to talk to you. I wish we could. I mean, we could go on forever, but yeah, yeah. Next time there's some kind of obvious alien psyop or something, we should definitely have you guys on again. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and if you want to have us on to, to to discuss any of the other four iterations of the Beyond, we'd be happy to come on and discuss that, or even our first book, The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship. That'd be great. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, we'll keep in touch for sure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you guys so much. government aliens are real you guys come on